If you could improve your software development productivity by 2 to 3x, would it matter? If you could figure out how to start saying yes to all the business requests you're currently saying no to, would it make a difference? What if you decided all this stuff was too hard or didn't make sense for your company when you went back, but your competitors decided to go all in and really start transforming the way they did software development? Can you see how that'd make a difference to your company, to your coworkers, and to yourself over time? 2 to 3x seems like a pretty ridiculous statement in terms of being able to get more productive. But in large organizations, I think it's real. I think it's realistic. At HP in 19, or in 2008, 2007, I had an opportunity to take over the LaserJet embedded firmware organization that was about 800 people worldwide. The worldwide spend was about $100 million a year. And for two decades since I'd been in the business, it had been the bottleneck for the entire laser jet printer business. We couldn't add a new product to our plans. We couldn't create the marketing capabilities that we wanted to because we always had to check with firmware, and too often the answer was no. And in 2008, everybody remember 2008? It was a big spending increase year. No, it wasn't so much. Um, we had a new executive vice president come in, senior VP and the costs were under constraint. We had to figure out how to reduce costs dramatically across the business. I had 30 days to come up with a plan to reduce my development costs from $100 million a year to 50 to 60. At the same time, we were doing a complete re-architecture of the system and throwing away the old code base and trying to figure out how to bring it up. I'd watched this business from the outside for a couple of decades and realized it was a constraint to the business. We couldn't move forward, we couldn't move faster. We needed to do something fundamentally different up until this time, HP had been trying to spin their way out of the problem with no success. We needed to engineer a solution. We needed to take a completely different approach. And we started applying what I would call agile and DevOps principles at scale. We didn't necessarily spend a lot of time on it at the team level, but we got my staff, over 800 people, thinking through how do we constantly figure out how to improve because there was a $2 billion business standing behind me. We'd thrown out the old architecture. We needed to get the new architecture out. And I was looking for anything I could possibly do to improve the effectiveness and productivity of the organization. And we went on a journey of continually trying to improve that. And after about three years, we looked back and we'd fundamentally changed the entire productivity of the organization. We'd reduced the cost from $100 million a year to $55 million a year. Firmware was no longer the bottleneck. When we wanted to add a new product to our plans and to our future roadmap, it was easy for us to look at it and say it does not take a lot of resources so we can add them. We were starting to release 140% more products than we were previously supporting at about half the cost. And the number and the capacity that we had for new features and new capabilities had gone from about 5% of everything we were doing to about 40% of everything we were doing. So we started saying yes to the business in a lot of fundamental ways. And as I checked with my co-author uh, a couple of months ago when I was back there talking about how things were going, they'd actually drained the swamp of marketing requests and they were actually working with the engineers to think up new ideas that they could add while they continued to reduce costs over time. Pretty dramatic improvements in the productivity of everything we were doing. Now the interesting thing is as we look back at it, we had a lot of teams that were implementing agile principles at the team level. They were doing burn down charts, they were doing stand ups, they were doing scrums, they were doing all those things. We had some other teams that really weren't implementing or practicing those team level rituals. And what we realized was there was not a dramatic change in productivity between the teams that were doing all the agile things and the teams that weren't doing all the agile things, but two to three X improvement in productivity at the overall organization which led to our conclusion that in a large enterprise, how the teams come together to deliver value is the first order effect. How the individual teams work by themselves is a second order effect. Now this is a case when you have more tightly coupled architecture that requires large parts of the organization to develop, qualify, and release code as a unit. It doesn't necessarily happen when you have organizations that have microservices architectures that you can have small independent teams develop, qualify, and release code independently. 
So if you're thinking of a large organization that's tightly coupled, you need to think about applying these principles. If you're more in a situation where you've got a very clean architecture with, that's very loosely coupled, you can think about more how do you empower the team and get people supported and make those types of things going. So when I talk about the Agile principles, I think it's pretty straightforward. And Dave can catch me if I get this wrong because he was there from the very beginning. Um, everybody understands the basic waterfall methodology and the realities of waterfall that it, when you try to lock in all three of those triangles and there's uncertainty and discovery in the process, you either work the teams to death or you slip the schedule or some combination of both. And the basic principle of Agile is to break that up into smaller iterations where you're releasing on a more frequent, ongoing basis. Well, if you have a large, tightly coupled system that includes hundreds to thousands of engineers, the small Agile teams aren't necessarily going to think about how do they coordinate and integrate and release their code on an ongoing basis. If you walk away from anything with this one talk, walk away with this, that in a large, complex organization, Scrum does not equal Agile. And if you're not really careful about how you do it, you're going to end up with the classic mistake that's made in most enterprises of creating a water scrum fall process. In this process, you have the team stand up doing really good iteration, but they're still committing to plans that are 12, 14, 18 months into the future, and they're still having a hard time integrating and releasing their code on a more frequent basis. A different approach, and the approach that I'm presenting in my second book that's coming out, Leading the Transformation, is you really shouldn't do Agile. You shouldn't do DevOps. You shouldn't do Lean. You shouldn't do any of those things. We're managing a business. We're part of a business. You should understand what you're trying to achieve for your business. And if you can't think about why your current development processes aren't meeting the needs of the business and clearly identify that, you shouldn't go off on a journey just to adopt the latest ideas or approaches. You should really start with why are, your, why are your current development processes failing to support the business needs that you have and get that very clear because a transformation like this is going to take a while and you always need to look at what's the long-term vision, what's the long-term direction, what are the things that are in the way of getting this done and what are we trying to achieve and then once you have the business objectives, you can start to look at the, your toolbox. And your toolbox has Kanban ideas, Lean ideas, Agile ideas, DevOps ideas. And you should take the tool out of the toolbox that's going to fix the problem that's your biggest barrier to making your business improve. The next thing I would say is you need an enterprise level continuous improvement process. It's not enough for each of your individual teams to be doing retrospectrics and doing reviews and trying to improve. Because if you're going to make these changes in large organizations, it's got to work across the organization. And you need your executives engaged in part of the process of setting the objectives and working with the organization to figure out what's getting in the way of getting things done and what's not. And then if you have a good process for changing your planning process to where it's responsive and reactive to what's going on and prioritize backlog, and then you have a good process for releasing code on an ongoing basis. In the enterprise, it does not need to be any more complex or difficult than that. But you need to continually learn and adjust. You need to start where you're going to have the biggest business impact. And you start, need to work on your planning process and your delivery process over, all across the organization. At HP, we very clearly started with our business objectives. And our business objectives were we didn't want firmware to be the bottleneck for the company anymore and we wanted to free up capacity for innovation. So when we looked at those things, we started looking at our value proposition, and we started looking at anything that was a cycle time driver or a cost driver that wasn't key to the value that we were trying to provide to the company, and anything that wasn't, we automated, we eliminated, or we engineered it out of the system. Fundamentally changed everything we were trying to do. The next thing is you need an executive-led continuous improvement process and this is more than just an aggregate of what the teams are doing. Because if you've got 1,000 people and you've got you know, 100 different teams, your strategy can't be an aggregate of all those different teams if you're going to try to coordinate work and coordinate improvement across the organization and make that piece work. So you need to start with setting objectives. I know most Agile teams will work on a two-week or a month or a one-week basis and sort of iterate and respond. But if you're in a large organization, I've found about a month works well. It gives you time to set those objectives 
and it also gives you time to get alignment across the organization that those things are important and achievable and possible to do. Once you set those objectives, you don't change them during the iteration. You focus in on them, and then as executives, what we would spend our time doing is trying to figure out what was getting in the way of organization's way of getting these things done. So you started the month with everybody in the organization bought into that these were important, they were a priority, and they thought they were possible to get done. And if they weren't get done during the month, as an executive, I had metrics I could review every morning, and I'd spend all my days out in the organization as an investigative reporter trying to figure out what was getting in the organization's way. And it wasn't going in and going, say, Dave, why didn't you get this done? It was, Dave, what happened? What got in the way? Why didn't this get done? And it wasn't why didn't Dave get it done. It was what got in the way of Dave being able to accomplish this and doing that. And through that process, you take those learnings, roll them into the next iterations, and start taking plans and removing barriers that were getting in the way of the organization being effective and productive. And it was an interesting cultural change as a you know, leader over an 800 person organization, when I started showing up at the desktop of an engineer that was struggling, it was a bit intimidating at first. But when they got used to me coming around and asking the questions and trying to figure out how to help, and they realized I was really there to help, it started creating transparency. With trust comes transparency, and with transparency comes the ability to fix things, and it's a culture that builds on itself over time. The next thing in the planning process that's interesting, and this is going to be the hardest in any organization to get the business to understand, because they manage everything else in their business with waterfall. They make commitments, they make plans, and most of the people in the organization don't understand software is different and needs to be managed differently. Probably the biggest challenge with software is we are so poor at predicting what software capabilities will add any value, that literally 50% of everything we do as an industry is, ever neither, is either never used or does not meet its business intent. Can you think of anything else in your business that has a 50% hit rate in terms of what's going to be useful in there? Executives need to understand that. They also need to understand that software is very different than everything else that you do. If you're going to build a new manufacturing plant, it may be a little different size, it may be a little different shape than anything that you've done before, but it's going to be leveraged off of most things that you've been doing for years and years over different times, and there'll be some discovery in the process. When you go off to write new software, you're doing it for the very first time, the very first time ever, and it's really hard to think through all the things, and you can sit around and plan and plan and plan, and basically, work your way up this slide where over time you can invest more and more in planning, but you meet diminishing returns. After a while, the best way to learn more about what your schedule is going to be is start writing code and start validating some of your assumptions and figuring it out. Most executives don't get that. And so hopefully chapter five of my new book is something that you can share and put on their desk, work through that, and help them understand that if they are going to be effective at managing software, they need to think about how to manage it differently. So 50% is never used. It, it's, it's hard to get it accurate, but the advantage of software is if you develop it right, it can be changed up to the last minute. Anything else an executive is doing in their business, if they get it wrong and they, they planned it wrong, it's very expensive to change. If you poured all the cement in a factory, but you had it planned wrong, that's going to be very expensive to change. That's not the case with software. So if you look at applying waterfall principles to software, you're at risk of making the classic mistake of taking your most flexible asset, turning it into a fixed asset to deliver features that will never be used or won't deliver any business value. You need to get executives to figure that out and figure out that managing software is differently. Otherwise, they'll waste a lot of resources working all the way out to the end, this end of the curve because they think if they just spend more time planning software, it will get better over time. Probably a lot of people more came to listen to the DevOps side of this. I've spent a lot of time implementing a very large-scale continuous integration thing at HP 
And then at Macy's, I'd let our transition to continuous delivery for the website or across the organization. A lot of the learnings will be shared based off of that. The first thing you need to start with are what are the objectives that you're trying to do if you're going to try to apply DevOps principles. If you're going to try to release on a more frequent basis, um, one of my experiences, we went in and we said, well, we're going to do continuous delivery, and we think it's important to do continuous delivery. And I joined the company because they had an effort to do continuous delivery, and I'd read Jess's book, and I liked it, and I wanted to go learn more about how to make that happen. And we'd taken one application, and we said, okay, we're going to do scripted environments, scripted deployments, automated testing, evolutionary database on that one application. What we quickly found over, not quickly, about over nine months, is we were struggling to deliver the value that we expected to and help the company because we couldn't independently develop, qualify, and deploy that code because it was too tightly coupled to the rest of the system. The organization was able to look back at us and see the fact that we'd invested a lot of money and time and resources trying to do continuous delivery, but it wasn't affecting their day-to-day -day work. And I went and spent the afternoon with Jez and brainstormed and worked on it for quite a while. And I realized we'd made a mistake that I didn't make at HP. At HP, we didn't go off to do Agile. We went off to improve our business and meet our business objectives. And so I stepped back from what we were trying to accomplish when we were doing continuous delivery and said, what are those objectives that matter? And the very first thing is we wanted to provide good, real-time feedback to the developers because we wanted to help them become better developers. We also wanted to make sure that was in an operational-like environment as we possibly could, because we wanted to make sure the operations team and the development team were aligned on common objectives, instead of developers trying to figure out how to get a feature done and sign it off on the desktop, and then throw it over the wall and ask operations to try to figure out how to get it into production. That doesn't work very well. The other thing in a large organization is you tend to take a lot of resources going from release branch into production. It takes a lot of time, like takes a lot of effort. That's non-value added in your system. And then the other thing we're focused on is we're struggling with the repro reproducibility and repeatability of our build, deploy, test process. So we wanted to clean that up. And when we focus down on these things, it really helped guide our, guide our directions. One of the biggest things you're trying to do in a large complex enterprise system is find the offending code so you can get it fixed, so you can get the quality up to the point where it re is releasable. Imagine everybody knows their top triages that go through the code in the beginning and the end game, and what they're trying to do is who brought in code that was offending. Now, if I go to Dave, and I go to Dave six, eight weeks after he's written some code and says, hey, Dave, it looks like you brought this in and it broke all these tests. What were you thinking what you were doing? To which point Dave's going to go, ah, uh, what test? When? Are you sure it was me? You know, Dan gets in that code a lot. I bet it was Dan and it probably wasn't me. And so what you're trying to do with your process of DevOps is really isolate who in the last six, eight weeks since your last release brought in that offending code and then give them that feedback. If you can do that within hours, I'm no longer beating up Dave for being a bad person. I'm helping Dave become a better programmer because I'm giving him the feedback in an operational-like environment to understand what it takes to make it work all the way out to the customer. And you get the organization focused on how do you transition this all the way through. The other big cultural change is developing on trunk. If you look at a very large, complex enterprise system and you say, we're going to do development all on trunk, uh, at HP, we had 20-some-odd different products we were supporting. We were supporting MIPS processors, we were supporting ARMS processors, we were supporting little printers, and we were supporting big copiers. We had different scanners, we had different paper handling, we had all those different things. All that was done on one trunk with ARMS, MIPS, XP, and CE. At runtime, compiled for the specific product. When I started talking to the organization about doing this, they thought I was crazy. They would avoid making eye contact when I walked down the hall. They'd go, just ignore him. He'll come back to his senses or he'll fire him. This is HP. It works that way. Um, and then over time, there was one day Roger Tweed came up to me. He goes, you know, I think we can make this work. We'll just feature bind this. We'll runtime compile it. We'll make it all work. We'll take all the if-then statements out of the code base. We'll put it in an XML file that defines the product. All the code will reference that product, and we'll quickly be able to port it to all these different products. Well, that started to make sense. It was really hard for my lead over release and test 
to figure out and build to figure out how to buy into this process. He thought I was crazy for the longest time. He actually would want to come up to me and talk to me on a regular basis. Okay, branching, we're going to branch. No, Troy, we're not going to branch. Because previously we would have like 10 different branches re representing products in different windows of releases. Like, no, Troy, we're not going to branch. He wore out a thesaurus trying to say branch without saying branching. He said, well, when we go to this different place at the end, <laughs> then how are we going to manage the code? And no, we're not going to branch Troy. It doesn't help to use different words. And after about two years, three years, I was getting ready for our first release of the new architecture for a scanner that we were trying to get out the door. And it's like, okay, Troy, I'm ready to branch. He's like, well, you're crazy. We can't branch and lose all the efficiencies of working on one trunk with all the automated tests and all the quick feedback, you're crazy. And then he went on a river trip down the middle fork of the salmon, and there's a fly-in ranch there halfway down. It's called the Flying Bee Ranch. And he came up to him with his hat on. He goes, we don't need no stinking bee ranch. <laughs> I like that story for a few reasons. One is until you've worked in this type of environment, you can't imagine working in this type of environment. Once you've worked in this environment, you can't imagine working any other way. I've had several people leave HP, call me up, go, Gary, you can't believe this new company I'm working at. They've got no system. They've got no continuous integration. All the automated testing is not working. I don't have the coverage. I don't have the ability to program with trust and reliability and go fast like I used to. I have to go slow, slow, and then I have to always be fixing things later. And then the code base I'm in is not stable, and I can't understand the effects of my changes. The key in this is going on that journey from non-believers to not being able to imagine working any other way. But you should start with your fundamentals. I think the biggest thing that people are starting to understand as they do continuous delivery is you're in one of these two camps. Almost everybody you'll hear presenting at conferences like Velocity or a lot of those has very clean architectures that enable small agile teams to independently develop, deploy, and qualify code. That's ideally where you should be. I'd love to be that way. I tend to work more in legacy, large legacy organizations that have architectures that look a little bit more like the architectural diagram on the bottom of the screen over there, where it takes hundreds if not thousands of people working together to develop, qualify, and deploy code. If you try to implement the ideas that you're hearing at the Velocity Conference, when you have an architecture that looks like a ball of string, it's not going to work very well. So before you start applying DevOps principles, figure out where you are in terms of that independence of teams and figuring out how to work together. I would encourage you, where possible, to architect. I think Rebecca covered some good information on how to re-architect the microservices to enable this to happen. Her comment was, you shouldn't do microservices until you've done continuous delivery, I guess my pushback on that is you should really think about going to microservices so it's doable and easy to do continuous delivery. But you can do it with large, tightly coupled organizations. It's just more complex and you need to think about it differently. The first thing I'd start with always is your build process. This may seem obvious, but can you draw a large architectural diagram of your main artifact that you're thinking about in the system, get a green build with some automated tests, and then if you go to version two of each one of those components and version B causes it to go red and you get a red build, can you just go back to version one of component B and get a green build? Or do you have libraries that are tightly coupled across the system that have dependencies across it so that you can't go back and forth that way? Because if you're going to build up a large complex system and you're going to keep it always green and releasable, if you can't fundamentally pull pieces out, whenever you get a red build up there, you're going to stop all the code progressing through the system, and it's going to become very painful. The next thing is test automation. I think Tricia and Jay presented some really good information in the last couple hours on how to do automated testing more at the unit test level. And that works well if you have it. And a lot of legacy, tightly coupled systems, frequently you can't depend on that because one, if you have legacy code, when are you going to get the time to go back through it and add a bunch of unit tests is probably not realistic to make happen. And if the code's too tightly coupled, you're going to need test automation system testing to enable you to find all the issues and give the feedback to the developers that you need. 
this is too important to be left to your QA organization. If you leave it to a QA organization that's been doing manual testing for years, they will automate what they've been manually doing and you'll find that you end up with a maintenance nightmare and you end up with uh, code that does not quickly localize the problem. And that's fine when you have a, a 10, 100, maybe 200, 300 tests, but when you start giving thousands of tests, that won't work. Jeff Morgan's got a fairly good example of how to do this with UI-based system tests where you've got business logic up in the UI. And what he does is basically he uses a puppy adoption website and teaches you how to do this. What he does is for each page, he creates a page object for each page in your website. And then when you hit that page, he has a data magic gem that automatically populates that with the data that you need. And then when you write a test, you say go from here to there. If you leave it to your manual organization to, do, to automate what they've been doing manually for years, what they're going to go through is they're going to say, okay, if I have a new credit card and I add new functionality, I want to make sure that that works. First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to go to Homepage, I'm going to go to Men's, I'm going to go to Blazers, I'm going to go to Blue, and I'm going to pick this, I'm going to add the product to my cart, and then I'm going to check out, does the credit card work? Well, that works fine when you have one or two of those tests, but when you have a thousand of those tests that start on the home page and the home page changes, you're dead in the water. But if you've taken a page object model approach then they, and they all reference that page object, the only thing you have to go update is that one page object. That enables you to keep UI testings up to date with your website and evolve with it and go with it as it comes along. This isn't the necessarily only way to do it or the right way to do it, but you need to think about how your application is going to be changing over time, and how do you design your system so when it changes, it only needs, your tests only need to change in one place and you can reference that. The other problem with this test is this was a checkout test to validate that the credit card worked well. If the checkout team is responsible for keeping that test passing on an ongoing basis and it's written that way, they're going to run into problems and you're going to find that they're not going to own the quality of that test because if the home page broke or the navigation broke or any of those other things that broke that weren't associated with what they were doing was not their responsibility and wasn't their code, then they're going to come in and look at a bunch of checkout tests broken and they're going to assume that they have to fix something. Your automated test should realistically start at the checkout page. It should pre-populate it with everything you need to do and validate that just that part of the code is broken. So getting the tests where they're maintainable and quickly localize the defects is important if you're going to be running thousands and thousands of tests and getting the team to own the quality of their code on an ongoing basis. Automated testing is probably your most valuable tool in trying to figure out how to transform it. I don't know how you'd transform it without it done well. I think it's most frequently thing that's done wrong in organizations. It gets maintainable. It gets where it's not maintainable from keeping it up and it gets to where it's not triageable in terms of automated it, being able to look at the test and figure out what's going on. It's too important to be left to your QA organizations. You should get an architect that really understands object-oriented programming and team them up with your test people and sort of make sure you come up with the right approach. Next, when you're doing continuous delivery, you need to think about you can do at a small scale a very long, complex algorithm and Jenkins that sort of sets this all up and makes it work. I would encourage you to think about more of the different principles that you're trying to accomplish in here. Um, you need a trigger that triggers off the build that says, I got a build, I'm going to kick these things off. You need to call your scripted environments and set that up separately. You need, to, you need your automated deployment, your evolutionary database, and your testing. If you try to build that all into one script, it gets similar to what you're trying to do with test automation, is when your logic, you're thinking about how your deployment pipeline needs to work changes over time, you end up having to update all these long monolithic scripts. If you can think about pulling that business logic up into your orchestrator, it enables you to leverage more common scripts across the system. The other thing that's important is if you're going to have a bunch of different environments that you're working across, Make sure that you have common scripts. You're probably not going to have environments that are all consistent, but similar like we did in the LaserJet business where you had an XML that separately defined the different products. Take that out of your common script so that you have a common script that you work, you automate, and you re reproduce it tens and hundreds of times before you ever go into production to make sure it's working, and you're just referencing the environment differences between the two places. 
you need to do the same thing with your automated deployment to make sure they're common. And if you have your operations team and your development team using different tools for this process, you're not going to start the cultural alignment across organizations that you need to have them working on common objectives. One of the biggest values of continuous delivery is when you go into production, you've already done it hundreds of times and worked out all the bugs. If you're using different tools or different processes in production than you are in development, you're not going to see the benefits of those changes. Evolutionary database, one of the biggest, bigger challenges of keeping code always releasable is when you bring in schema changes. A lot of people will come up and say, no, I can't keep it always releasable. I've got to make this schema change. We have to coordinate it. If you have your DBAs bringing that up, buy them this book, have them read it, it's solved. You do add and deprecate, you don't ever modify. Lazy instantiation, if you do alter or modify, it's like crossing the beams, cats start sleeping with dogs, all sorts of bad things happen, and you can't have always releasable code. You need to do the same thing with your services, they need to be versioned and work through that process. When you're doing automated deployment, Frequently what people do is they're deploying across a large number of servers. You deploy the code, you, or you configure the environment, you deploy the code, you run your automated tests, and then they fail, and you start a big, long, complex triage process. And you've got to figure out what routing or what server is in a bad configuration or bad state. That can be as complex as finding bad code that was brought in in the last several months and trying to localize it to the offending person, and it can be Equally worse, if you have the same application running on several different servers, but the deployment only failed on one of the servers because then it's very intermittent. Somebody sees it when they test, somebody else doesn't see it when they test, and you need to work through that. We ran into this in the last implementation of continuous delivery I did, and what we, what we found is we'd spend two or three days with the team trying to get the build back to green, and there was a fail, and they are trying to figure out what was going on. They said, well, it's pretty clear here that, you know, don't bug us again because this deployment wasn't successful. And I said, well, how can you tell that? As well, if you go into log file and you look in these areas, you can see this, oh, great, let's start adding that as a test. And so similar to what we're trying to do with build frequency and some other things to localize the offending code to the fewest number of people as possible, what you're trying to do with your deployment process is localize the offending environment or deployment to the fewest number of routing devices or servers as you possibly can. So start off with configuring your routers and your server devices, run a test to validate that that's successful. At the end of each deployment, run a test to make sure that that deployment was successful. And then run your code validation when you run your system tests. This isolates in a very large complex organization the code issues from the deployment issues. And you don't want to waste your time on these things. And anytime you're finding deployment or environment issues, when you're running your final system test, it tells you that you need another post-validation test that you need to add in the process to find these things and localize them earlier. When you're building up a large complex system, say you have a bunch of large agile organizations but you're hooked to COBOL mainframe type applications, how do you build up and integrate a very large enterprise system like that? The first step is always start with your Agile components, make sure that you've got unit tests that are passing and you've got you know, static code analysis type of things going. What you're trying to do is keep really bad code from getting in and damaging the entire system. And this is an ideal first step. I can't think of any reason why a developer would be allowed to check in unit code that's not working. Can't think of any reason a developer would be allowed to check in unit code that is not working. Jay sort of said, well, there's bad unit code and there's stuff that can be done and people write it poorly. When they realize the pain of that, they'll start cleaning those things up and, and doing it. But if they can check in code and you've got a bunch that are failing and a bunch that are passing, how do you decide whether you can let people check in or not? The next step is breaking up the system. I found service virtualization. You could call it a mock. You could call it a stub. But how do you isolate certain parts of your system so you can localize the code? There's, there's three steps that you're going to take to localize. One is build frequency. The more frequently you can build and the better feedback you can give on that, the more you're going to localize it to a few num fewer number of developers. The second is breaking up components that get qualified and then built up into a larger system. So if you have two different organizations, one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast, you may want to think about a continuous integration that builds as much of that system as frequently as you can a system that builds as much of that as frequently as you can and then put the system together. 
Service virtualization you should avoid wherever possible as much as you can because it's something you're going to have to maintain and it's something that could be different. But when you have extremely large organizations, it does break down the complexity and enable you to keep this going. And then once a day or so, you should always make sure you're pulling the virtualization out and doing end-to-end -end testing. The other important thing about this is if you have very complex systems hooking to things like COBOL and some of those other things on mainframes, if you do end-to-end -end testing with everything, it's very expensive, it's hard, it's almost more complex to set up those big, large environments and run all the testing. In my last job, if we started with 1,300 tests that we ran about every 10 days to release code on it to the website on an ongoing basis. When I left, we were close to 20,000 tests we were running every day. If I had been running all those tests against the mainframe and being charged for my processing on the mainframe, the CFO would have hunt me down and shot me because I would have driven costs out. So the idea here was test as much of the system back here and then if I had 100 tests that sort of did end-to-end -end testing and used the service in a similar way, run the hundreds of tests when I was in this phase of my deployment pipeline, and then when I got to this phase, just pick the one that I thought added the most value and do the end-to-end -end testing on it. It's different from how a lot of organizations approach it, where they want to have the customer sign off on end-to-end -end testing with everything, and you spend a bunch of your time and effort trying to put the whole system together and make it work. The other thing that I would say, you heard of people talking earlier about how do you get your teammates bought in and encouraged to keep a bill green and make it work on an ongoing basis? Because what you'll get is a train wreck on the system that everybody has to stop developing code, deploying it, get it in the end on a regular basis, or else you know, you're just building up a tarball and you can never get back to a green build. At HP, we had a bunch of stuff we were trying to get done. I had an organization breathing down my throat to look at the feature throughput and what was getting done. And we ran into a day that either an intermittent code or an intermittent test made it into the system, and we were getting red builds. And the build team was getting frustrated. Everybody in the organization was getting frustrated. The build teams added.